what we're going to do is get ourselves started by quickly introducing myself. I'm Mark Andre. I'm the um, I'm the uh, Ed Automation Nerd for SolarWinds MSP, actually enabled now as of uh, this week. So uh, I'm glad to be part of the group that helps create a lot of automation, scripts, automation objects, things like that. Um, so long story short, that's kind of what I do. I help partners day in, day out with how to use a platform more efficiently, how to create automation scripts, things like that. So if you have any questions you see on the screen, you can reach out to me anytime you want. Pretty easy to do so. Uh, we also have Jason Murphy joining us today. He's our Central nerd. Um, he works within uh, the automation group to help us create a ton of value within the company. He's had the chance to work with a really large MSP here in Canada and develop a lot of expertise around system architecture, managing and central and working with different other RMM platforms. So very, very glad to have him here with us to answer some of the questions. So. Thank you for being here, Jason. Welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. And uh, as usual, just a reminder, the um, the Enable Resource Center is where you want to go for more, mostly anything. This is where we put a lot of our help stuff. This is where you can open support cases, view our forums. The forums is where you want to go to have discussions and ask your other MSPs. A lot of people subscribe to them. They get notices and then they can answer, help out. Um, and also, obviously, our group uh, reviews them constantly, so definitely a good place to go. The Institute is your one-stop shop for anything to do with training. This is where we put recordings for events like these. This is where we put all of our boot camps, where there's a ton of training resource available. Um, this is owned by Aris, um, and he's doing a fantastic job of putting a ton of content there. So if you're not taking advantage of it, this is a free resource. I really suggest that you do. And go take a look. And finally, if you have ideas or suggestions for the products for us, go to the ideas page. This is something that's heavily reviewed uh, by our product team to figure out what you guys need um, and uh, help build from that. All right. So, what are the office hours? Um, honestly, it's a pretty simple thing. It's a topical Q and A. We do them around security, around the platforms and automation. We do it around backup for people who use our backup products and so on um we do one on business and so and so on as well on those uh it is meant to help you guys engage with industry experts being the people that are on there some of them will help us answer questions from time to time which is nice um but it's also a place that uh, lets you interact with jason myself and other people to ask questions a big part of the head nerds program is to help foster an online community we want to help you guys grow closer to each other we want to help you guys communicate and interact with each other more effectively so that's really a big chunk of uh, of these office hours is to start bringing people together, is to start getting you guys the answers you need to the questions you have. Um, we also want to help you guys grow your business. Um, this is another big part of the Head Nerd program is that we're there to help you guys grow. We're there to, we're there to be your advocates. We're there to be your trainers. We're there to be your experts. Um, because the more you grow, the more we grow. It's very organic. This is not a sales pitch. This is literally how this works, right? Like you guys grow and have a few more customers you're more efficient you're doing better you're going to use our product more you're going to deploy more agents and then we make more money you guys make more money and everybody's happy it's a very symbiotic relationship this is not so much a sales relationship so that's why we're there to help you guys we also want to get feedback from you guys on product and different suggestions we feed all that back to the product team we discuss it with them and sometimes if it's something that i can control i can actually build it myself i've done that for several of the automation objects and automation manager as well so Having said all that, um, there's a ton of resources. I already talked about those, actually. Yeah, mostly most of those I've already talked about. So I'm going to skip over most of it. The um, next thing, though, is what's new in the cookbook. I try to put that slide now every month. This is the new automation that was added in the last month in the cookbook. There was um, partners who were asking me to do a policy to enable RDP. That was actually during last month's office hours, this one here. Someone asked me to, uh, actually it was during the Empower presentation, to do an automation policy to re-enable RDP. Some people were disabling it and now they need it. So we made a quick little policy for that. Cleaning up windows.old, uh, a partner was asking me, it was that right actually, that was asking me to do a cleanup of the folder. So we worked together on this um, and we were with the, to clean up the windows.old folder. This folder gets really big over time when you do major windows releases, the, um, the big twice a year updates. This folder basically gets saved as a backup of the window for a rollback. 99% of the time, you're never going to need that. It takes a tremendous amount of space if you have a smaller drive. So we wanted a way to clean that up, so we gave him that. 
Um, we also made a few policies around patching, forcing reboot after 14 days. So if it's been longer than X, request a reboot. Um, this one is for RMM. This is the RN Central version. So it basically looks at the login check to uh, see, uh, you know, okay, you're outside of business hours. Uh, is the user logged in? When is the user logged in outside of, of the hours that he wants based on the events? And then it notifies you of that through monitoring. So that's the new one. Um, this one was added uh, to uh, to add to sorry to disable and use an interest. We thought it was in 21 uh, H1. It was actually in 20 H1. It was last year um, that was added. That was added this feature, but the partner shared a script to disable that. So if you're interested, you can grab it. We also added a few to monitor battery capacity. This was something that a uh, redditor posted. It went into the uh, the Slack channels, and we said it was a good one for everybody. So we posted it, uh, and then. Couple new ones that were recently added. Uh, those are this, those are July, but I wanted to mention them anyways. The first one is to mitigate the print nightmare uh, vulnerability that was discovered and uh, came out. This is one where a third party can uh, execute uh, code, so you can go and, and grab those. And finally, the Kaseya endpoint detection tool. I'm not going to go too deep down the Kaseya rabbit hole, but we uh, we saw that Kaseya published an, an automation script, a PowerShell script to monitor their agents for any signs of issues so if you have customers that also have the Kaseya deployed or maybe you don't even know they're there you can run this if you're not using Kaseya and they're not using it anywhere this will just go in with a pass status and everybody's happy if anybody is using Kaseya and are vulnerable this would warn you and you would be able to take action on it and discuss it with them so this is made to be, this is meant to be made into a monitoring service so those are all brand new from the last month or so and they're available in the cookbook if you want to go grab them so that's cool Having said that, that's enough. Let's go into the Q&A. Um, about 10 minutes in, that's what I like to be in at that point anyway, so that's good. Um, I'm not seeing many questions, guys, so make sure you put your questions in the questions pane. Let me know what you would like to see, and I'll um, I'll be able to, uh, to answer them as they come in. The first one I have is uh, around Central. Um, it's the printer vulnerability uh, for Print Nightmare. Uh, how are we mitigating that, and what does that policy do? So let me... Just, you know, let's quickly uh, take a look at it. So if I go into the cookbook, let me go here. Go into the cookbook. Let's take a quick look at it. This is the, oh, actually, it doesn't matter. Oh, that one is the removal. So you can undo the fix. The fix is actually the disabled remote printing, if I'm not mistaken. That was built by um, by Lewis, our, um, our security nerd. So I'm going to quickly just download this and open up automation. And I'll show you guys what it does. It's pretty straightforward stuff. It's not that complicated. Um, but as these these issues occur in the field, we're trying to be as quick as we can to post different scripts to help you guys out. So this one basically just goes into the access list and disables um, remote printing. So it's basically putting a firewall rule and blocking um, blocking the access to the spooler to remote access. So this is this should be mitigating the issue. If you are having customers complaining of issues with remote printing, obviously you could use the, uh, the disable one. So this one is removal, this is to undo it. A lot of times when we deploy scripts to do things like that, to turn on a specific fix or an issue, on an issue, we'll usually do the uh, the reverse as well. So this one just undo, undoes what it, the other one went and did to make sure that it's clean and nicer. So that's nice. So those are available in the cookbook. So a good, good question that we could answer that. Next one we have is, are there any plans to introduce API endpoints that will allow us to get and trigger automation policies on endpoints? Uh, long and short is yes and no. Uh, long is yes, uh, because we are working on new APIs based on REST that will include triggering activities in NCentral, like AV scans, automation policies, um, and different things like that. Um, so, but short term, realistically, no. This is going to be more of a, uh, I believe, maybe Q4, maybe next year type of deal. Um, so I don't expect that to be done very short term, Alfie. Uh, sadly, this is not something that I'm expecting. I have been very diligently pushing for it. I have been very heavily uh, requesting it and discussing it and back and back and forth with everybody. But as of today, this is not something that I have uh, available in the short term. Uh, having said that, you can kind of cheat if you wanted to go that route. If you have a third party tool, um, and it needs to trigger an automation based on a specific rule, what you could simply do is leverage custom properties. Uh, so if you make a custom device property, like this one, let's see, whatever, 
you can have specific data points uh, set in it, like a yes or no, like you can make drop down ones, right? So you could do a drop down field and say like blue, orange, purple, yes, no, whatever. And this would trigger an automation. So you could say whenever that is set to yes, put a, an automation policy through a, 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 a task profile. So what I would do by, what I mean by that is it would come in and make a filter to target this custom property based on the value. So I would come in and say, add a filter. And then I would say uh, device, custom device property, I'll say color is equal to, let's say blue and then test. And then you would make that filter. You would save this. Now, as it would find people that are set to blue or purple or whatever color, you would then uh, be able to put a rule in place that would trigger automation. Um, and then you would be able to simply run it as needed. So if you say, okay, these customers uh, are requesting through my web portal, these automation policies to run recurringly, like a maintenance or things like that, you could simply target it that way. And there are uh, there are API endpoints uh, that are usable um, to play with custom properties. Um, hold on, let's use this one. Um, so the yeah, actually the device property will be the easiest one. And you you can actually set the device property um, to whatever you want. So you can say the device property would be your um, your color. I'll say set it to blue, set it to whatever. And by setting it, you would be able to trigger automation. So at this point, the only automation I can offer you for this, it works really well. I've done it in the past, but it is obviously tedious because you would have to integrate with that endpoint instead of integrating with something that would say run automation policy ABC. Um, but like I said, I am I am lobbying very, very heavily to have that feature added just natively. But at the moment, it's pretty much the only way. So that's good to know. Good question. I like it. Next one is going to be... B, do, 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 do. I've made a service that checks backup uh, status or statuses, yeah. Um, I would like to have my AMP make a monitor per backup job like we do for Veeam or other ones. Uh, can this be done? At the moment, no. I have been asking the dev team to give us the ability to auto-discover based on automation. So basically say, for this policy, automatically add five instances based on XYZ. Uh, I'm asking for this for all kinds of things, being I'm building, you know, we have the new monitoring that we did for Meraki. If we could auto-discover or deploy, that'd be fantastic. I wanted to have the same thing for a backup job. I want to have the same thing for cloud management and so on and so on. Um, so the more, um, the more that uh, this gets requested, the more this is likely to come to fruition. So Patrick, maybe send me a quick email. Uh, yeah, you said all of those. Yeah, I know. I want all of those things as well. So send me an email. I'll gladly put put that towards the the request, um, and I will make it easier. Um, but yeah, that's a very very good question. I'm glad you'd asked that. Um, so that's good. Um, but as of today, sadly, I don't have an answer. There's no way to do it. What I do when I build custom monitoring like this, I typically do a summary service to say, are there any backup with issues? And then if you know you want to ignore job A, B, and C. You can make an input parameter and say jobs to ignore, and then you would just put those as, those as ignored, for example. And I know it's not ideal. I know it sucks, but it's the only way at the moment to do it. The way that Veeam does it, or the other ones that are natively built, is because there's code in the background that runs something that will go and grab these job IDs, and then it creates instances. That's part of our discovery process, but that's hard-coded for those scripts and those jobs. That's what I'm asking them to do, and we're flexible. So we'd have to say, okay, for this service, run this AMP and then whatever it outputs, then use that as input for the new one. Well, it's kludgy, but it's, it's kind of the way it has to move. But that is not something that's available today, Patrick. Uh, but that's a very, very, uh, very good point. And we keep getting asked for that. So, yeah. Um, all right. And same same person, Patrick says, he's built a better mitigation now for print nightmare, does more things. Can you submit it? Absolutely, you can. I'm so glad you asked. Um, honestly, guys, a lot of partners don't really know this. We get requests all the time. If you want to upload a script, you just need to log in first. I'm not logged in because reasons. Uh, so I'm going to log in here and come on, buddy. Okay, I'm not going to log in because I'm not going to do this right now. Uh, I don't. Okay. So when you're in the cookbook, if you're logged in, all right, this is starting to annoy me. Incognito mode. So see, it's used for more than one thing. Uh, I'm gonna go here, and I'm gonna. I would just say, click this button here. It said login to upload. Once you're logged in and your password has changed, you click this button, and then you can upload the script. The reason I say use this is because this gets tracked into the background, 
and this is part of our MVP program uh, where this counts towards that um, as part of your, your, the scoring. So if you would like to upload scripts, submit things for the community to you know get your name out there, to just be a nice person, a nice neighbor, click the button, upload whatever you got. If you don't think it's good enough, still submit it. We add stuff all the time. And honestly, the more partners share, the better the community grows and the better, the more we'll see in the cookbook. Like we're trying to grow it by 10 to 20 a month. Typically about 80% is built by me and then 20% is built or me and Jason and the rest of it is built by partners or other colleagues. But the more you guys want to submit, absolutely. So Patrick, if you build something that you think is better, please put it there. Jason and I will review it, we'll reach out to you and we'll, uh, we'll get that uploaded as an alternative and absolutely would love to promote that. So. Yeah, definitely good question. Definitely a good one. And next question from Alfie. Uh, are there any plans to use PowerShell core to allow cross-platform scripting tasks? Yes, there is. And yeah, it's going to take some time. We've started the work as of the last month or so to look into this. Actually, I think Chris might have mentioned this in his, um, in his roadmap presentation. This was just started. Uh, I've been pushing for this for years. Uh, PowerShell Core, being PowerShell 6, allowed this, and that was back out six years ago, five years ago now, it's so long. And then PowerShell 7 came along and got ignored by mostly everybody. And now that Microsoft will be pushing PowerShell updates, we're gonna st start supporting PowerShell 7 natively because we'll need to. And as we do this, uh, this is giving us a cross-platform that we want. The problem with the cross-platform, to be completely transparent, I've looked into it heavily with the dev team, it is that the cross-platform feature of, um, of PowerShell has very, very limited capabilities in different OSs. So even though I made a script to work in Windows, the same script will likely not work in Mac OS or Linux or whatever other OS is. And that is because the commands are different or some commands just simply will not work on Linux and, and in Mac OS. So they have to be rebuilt. So basically what we'll need to do is build a set of objects for Windows, a bit, uh, build a list of objects for Mac and Linux, and then use a run script object for each of those separately. So we'll make policy that run on either one of those OSs. That is what we're working towards uh, to allow you guys to do automation on any of the three platforms that way but this is going to be a little bit of work more than we were expecting but it's this is something that is actually now in the works at least being looked into deeper than it was before so um i'm going to follow up with the dev team and see what kind of details they have on, on updates for the next one but as of right now i know at least it, the work started which is a very very uh interesting one so yeah that's nice uh so guys if you have more questions please don't forget to put them in there just let me know uh, what I can answer. And the next question I have is talking about the Kaseya attack and scripting and what this script does. Okay, fair enough. Um, I didn't want to go too deep into this um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that I don't want to get too much in trouble, but either way, I'll go into the high level of this. Um, this script was built by Kaseya. If you go look at the Kaseya article here, this is not a us script. We took the script from somewhere on that page. If you Google it, if you look at this there, there's a link to a PowerShell script in a Dropbox page. We took that and then we uh, we made it into an automation policy. The reason that we went that route um, is that uh, we wanted to give the monitoring capabilities of the script. The script basically what it does is that it will go through um, the customer's uh, device and we'll check, first of all, is Kaseya installed? If Kaseya is not installed, it will return a pass status because the vulnerability is around Kaseya. It's not around anything else right now, which lock on wood, um, but that's what it is. So having said that, what we do is uh, we leverage that script that Kaseya built. It's not a me thing again, like I said, I just modified it. But what it does is it will go and grab the software key. We'll look for Kaseya and look at the agent path. Then it's going to look for suspicious files based on a specific type of encoding. Then it'll say, I found a suspicious certificate in the install, which is uh, reminiscent of what the vulnerability gets hacked with. Then it also looks for suspicious execu executables and look again for a specific hash. Then, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. then it goes through and looks for, there it is looks for signs of encryption. So basically it looks for a readme file or something like that in the agent path that says your files are encrypted, call us, blah, 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 right? So it looks for all of these signs and then it outputs that back. So for Ancentral, you can very easily make this into a custom service. 
and then you can add that to all your devices. And then if anybody has Kaseya detected and they're okay, it'll just be a pass. Everybody's happy. If you have Kaseya and uh, any of those check fails, it would trigger a fail state, and then you would know what's happening. So this is something that you're you're able to leverage through um, through the tool. So if you are interested in using that, that is definitely something that uh, I would recommend to deploy everywhere and and use. Obviously, like I always, always say, test it first, make sure it makes sense and make sure it works for you. And then once you're comfortable with it, go ahead and deploy it. We did test it internally. Everything seemed very clean. The script, like I said, came from Kaseya. I just added some, some hardening around it. And uh, there's also an update that was done this morning. So if you use the one from yesterday, make sure you come and grab the new one because the um, the new one is a little deeper and looks at actual um, actual crypt uh, encryption evidence, which the other one didn't. So that is something that you'll want to make sure that you leverage. Um, but yeah, that's pretty easy. So good good one there. Um, do -do 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 -do, what else we got? Next question. Last time I tested, automation policy execution does not survive a reboot. Honestly, I wasn't aware of an issue with that. Um, let me take a look and see what, we, what we're talking about here. So, Alfie, what I'm thinking you're talking about is the new object to execution policy. Oops. Uh, execution, there it is. Set execution policy. I'm thinking that's what you mean. Um, current machine or local. Oh, sorry. I said. Uh huh. Okay, so I'm, I'm confused. You're saying it's not that. Can you clarify what we're looking at here? Uh, Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, 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 okay. Now I understand. What he's saying is, if I do a policy that says, let's say, lock, right? Like says, uh, like puts a message here and say hello, and then it says uh, reboot machine. Uh, no, not reboot. Crown, just reboot. Uh, restart. Where is it? Uh, initialize system restart, and then I would put another log again and say, okay, after the reboot, whatever, right? Like this after a reboot this is not going to work no and that is by design the policy stops when you reboot it doesn't have a way to interrupt itself so if you need to do something like this you need to do a reboot and then you need to check after a reboot you would need to do two different policies that run at different times we, do, we see this quite a bit with uh, specific updates or application issues or domain changes things like that which you would typically do is do it through monitoring where it would say okay monitor if you know this condition is met, and then when it is, trigger a failed or a warning state, and then trigger an automation to do whatever you need it to do, and then you would go through that. But no, the fact that it does that, that's actually intended. This is not something that is to be fixed. Um, this is a limitation of the way that the engine works, and changing that will require a very significant uh, amount of work. Um, just because of the way that policies run, they have a limited lifespan, and basically the whole policy runs within a silo, if you reboot, you lose your variables, you lose a lot of things, and it just wouldn't work very well. Um, so the same reason that most programs, when you reboot, will have to reopen. Well, like Office will resume its state because it saves where it's at, but that's what I mean. That's what we don't have to implement, which we haven't done at the moment. Uh, that is not something that's been on the, uh, the, the priority list to do. Uh, I'm not saying I wouldn't like that. I would love to do it, but at the moment, sadly, it's not something there. Um, Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, how do we upgrade a VMware host? Uh, or is it even possible through automation? Uh, yeah, actually, it kind of is. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the native VMware objects will give you a lot of different capabilities. I don't think there's one for update. You can update the tools on the guest. But on the host, choo, 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 I don't think there it is. No. On the host. What you would need to do first is just connect to it. What I would then do probably is make a snapshot, like create a snapshot of those VMs. And once you've done all that, what you would need to do is use SSH automation. I think it's the only way I can think to do any of that. So what you would do is do your open session. You would link your IP. So if you're not familiar with how this would work, let me just walk you through it very quickly. I'm going to click input and make an input parameter and say in IP, IP address, and then you know, when you would say zero one, whatever and okay and then i would do the same thing for the username and password so in user username and then you know root and then finally in password password and that is a password field the password field will not let you put that in as a pre-type 
That is a security feature that is by design. This was debated heavily at the time of conception and some people wanted it available, but for security, we chose not to allow it so that people cannot reverse engineer the password and just grab it and do whatever they want. Um, so this is not allowed. When you run the policy, the password will get passed, um, will get passed through um, securely to the device to be used, but it's not gonna be saved anywhere. So what I would do is I would link those. So to link them, use a little chain link looking icon. I honestly don't know what it's supposed to be. I think it's a chain link, but I have no idea. It's not very uh, visible. So what you do is you link all these, and then what you would do, you would probably need to do, uh, I don't know if you need anything, uh, but either way, uh, what you would do is you would send the commands. So uh, send command. Now, I believe you would probably need to do a sudo first, so you would do here, um, and what you do is you link the session ID like this, and then you would do uh, link the password again from your root, and then you would say uh, sudo su dash. I believe to do the update, you'll need that. And um, and then from there, um, what you would do is you would link again to the session ID, just like that. Um, there you go. And then the command that you would run, uh, let's say I want to patch, um, I want to do a specific uh, bib patch or something like that. Um, honestly, there's different commands that they will allow you to do to go into, you have to go into update mode, you have uh, maintenance mode, sorry, which I believe I did put that, did I put that? Um, I don't know if I made an object for this. I know I was looking into it. I don't know if I had, if I was able to do it. Um, hold on. Maintenance. Yeah, enable ESX maintenance mode. So what you would do is you could use the ESX object to just say enable maintenance mode and then put the ESX connect object first. Then you would run the command to command. Um, there's a few different ones. Uh, you would need to get whatever patch you're looking for, uh, but it would be, you know, something like that. So ESX CLI software, and then VIB, and then whatever install, and then whatever file you want to get from there, right? And then you could do the update. You could also do the command to download the update from the web, and then so on and so on. Um, but that would be a way to connect uh, to to your um, your end device from here. Um, I'm not going to give you guys a full example of this because I don't have an example to test it again um, against. And also, I'm not even sure if I would usually recommend that. ESX is so intricate and complex at times that it might be better to do it by hand or to do it through the GUI. Uh, I don't know personally if I would do it through, through the shell in, to begin with, but if you wanted to, that would be a um, um, that would be something that you could do. All right. Next question I have is from Eli. He's saying, uh, hey, is there a way to deploy BIOS updates to workstations and laptops safely? Um, honestly, not really that I know of. Um, I know some BIOS updates now get pushed directly from uh, Windows updates. Um, I know some tools uh, like Dell, they have their own universal BIOS update uh, for a lot of things. They have their, their 64 bit automated, automated um, but it's from command line. So my answer would probably be no. Um, I know I've seen people do it, um, but I've not seen people do it successfully, I think is the honest truth. Um, even for known BIOSes, um, for a variety of reasons, honestly. Um, so if you have a customer that has, you know, a thousand machine and they're all the same model, the same brand, the same, even, because even within the same brand, sometimes a lot of different BIOSes based on revisions. So if you push the wrong BIOS by mistake, it's either gonna refuse or it's gonna be dumb enough to accept it. Um, so that's tricky. Now, if you, like I said, if you're a specific vendor, there are tools like HP, like Chris is saying, thank you, Chris, is saying that uh, you know the HP image assistant will do BIOS updates, so you could use use that from PowerShell. So he says he's using that within Central and on and uh, PowerShell, and that works for him. So yeah, there are ways for specific vendors to do it. Um, I know MSI does he does theirs a lot uh, through Windows updates and their own uh, live update. 
I personally recently bought in a new Asus laptop, and I know Asus, it seems like it did it from Windows Update, which is also really nice, makes it a lot easier. Um, but there's no universal way to do it. I would have loved to build that automation years ago, just give it to everybody, but it seems like every vendor just chooses what they want. They also give you the capability to choose which update you want, which different biases, and so on and so on. So we just kind of stayed stayed clear of this for those reasons. Uh, I'm not saying it's not a valid thing, it's just I, we haven't touched that. Um, so yeah. Um, next question. Um, is there any option in Automation Manager to modify local GPOs and agents that are not in the domain? Honestly, 98% of GPOs are basically registry changes. So if you Google, um, you know, local security policy registry uh, location, like 90 some percent uh, of uh, what you find in um, of what you find in the uh, local security policy there's the, those are available in the registry like for example these uh, access the path restricted things like that you can make all of those in the registry so what i've been telling people is look for the ones you would like to change and then if we clean that up a tiny bit let me just clean that up. then use the registry like this and then say okay first of all uh, does the registry key exist or not but the easiest is just to create it so what i would usually do is say does that value exist? So um, we're going to local machine, the current call, current policy. Then it'd be under uh, software, uh, current set, whatever. Again, it's not the right thing, but who cares? Just you know something, something, whatever. And then the property would be test. Now it says if it does not exist. So if. And what I typically do here uh, is say okay, well if it does not exist, I say. Um, so if it does exist you see set it if it does not exist you create it and it does both at the same time that's just the easiest um, but yeah you can just do whichever and then it says say okay what's the value what is the key then you see this allowed allowed whatever so uh, Alistair you can actually do that pretty easily what I would recommend uh, Alistair when you start doing that reach out to me let's do a couple together I'll walk you through the process on a call it should be very quick and then what we can do is we can share it back with the community if you're willing to do that with me. Let's just make sure we can share it back with everybody. We'll put it in the cookbook and we'll put a couple examples and make it easier for everybody. Um, so what I'll do is I'll put my email for everybody here. Um, what's my new email? They keep, we changed yesterday. Uh, let's try that. I think that's my email. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, so yeah, send me an email. Let's take a look. And let's go from there. Uh, I'm still back like, from last week being on a vacation, but I'll do my absolute best to take a look at that very quickly with you. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. All right, next question from Alfie. Is there any way to take a uh, VMware snapshot on a VM and then update Windows on those VMs within the same policy? Within the same policy, no. But um, what you could do is uh, if you know that all those VMs are connected to this host, as part of the policy, what you can do, uh, you can do one of two things. You could do a sub policy and add policy A run policy B. So on that Windows VM, you would run to connect to VMware and do everything. It, the only assumption is that you have PowerCLI installed. Uh, and it seems like my, yeah, I think both emails will work, but I'll give you both just in case. Yeah, I think they've given us multiple aliases, Lewis. Um, so yeah, so, because all right, so what you would do is one policy to create all the snapshots that you need, and the other one to do the uh, the what you need. So what I've seen people do more successfully, just to be completely honest, is I've actually seen people come in, run a policy to um, do snapshots on everything. So what they would do is say, connect the ESX, right, put in the IP and everything, easy. Then what you would do is um, you would want to basically just check first of all are there snapshots, but if you don't care. I can just say run this and I can say do a snapshot on everything. I don't know if it's a good idea, but you can. Uh, personally, I like to name the snapshot. So what I'm going to do is say get date. Hey, I said get date. And the other one is going to be format string. The reason I use those, you'll see why in a second. I'll go year, month, day, hour, minute, seconds. Hold on. Is that right? That's right. Uh, I think it is. Uh, so what I'm going to then do is link the get date to this, and then I'm going to say, 
snapshot pre maintenance dash this. So basically, what it's going to do is going to make a snapshot with this name that I can then link right here, like that. And then I would link my session ID to my session ID. The VM, I would put star because I know if I look in the object here, when I made this object, I made sure to support wildcard. So if I see everything, it will just go for everything. See here, the example shows that. And then this would basically make a snapshot on everybody. So if you know you're doing your Windows update at 10 p.m. on all the VMs, you could say at 9.30, do a snapshot of everybody. And then at 10 p.m., the update runs. Um, and then, that will just allow you to, to automate that maintenance. Doing it in the same policy, sadly, you can't. If you wanted it more in the same and you don't use our patch management the way it's meant to be used, what you would do is um, you could use the same policy. So do all the snapshots and everything. So you would have to pass the policy, all the credentials and, and type it. But as long as you do that, what you would then do is uh, uh, you force Windows updates and just say reboot and auto accept everything. This would simply trigger all the Windows updates that are needed. Um, but like I said, this is very aggressive. I don't know if I support that or I recommend it, but if that's what you want to do, you want to just disregard the approval process, just say, let's create, do it. That is a way to do it, if that's what you want to go with. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, that's essentially that one. Um, Trying to think if there's anything else on that example. Uh, no, I think that's it. Um, so yeah, okay, thank you. Next question I have is, uh, how do I do branded prompts or nagging alerts to the end users? That's actually a really good question. Let me see. What you can do, uh, I'm gonna clean that up, start again. Uh, we added recently, if you look at prompt, we added, well, recently, I bought it almost a year ago now, it's about 10 months ago, we added the input prompt, reboot prompt, and scheduler prompt. These three prompts are now allowing you to, you could do an input prompt to ask for something and make input buttons, that's what you wanted to do. Or the reboot prompt is what I'm thinking that you're looking for, is that I could say, hey buddy, you need to reboot your computer ASAP, please. All right. And this is rich text, so I could say, I could put ASAP in bold, I can make this bigger, whatever, right? Then I say, okay, you can delay up to two hours, and I can say, can they decline it or not? Now, the cool part is that if you go into options, you can go to branding, and you can choose your own image, your color scheme, and everything you want, and then you run this. This will allow you to have a pop-up that is branded and customized to you into automation manager now this is branded based on the branding of your ui or designer so like i put my image there i say refresh this downloads the the branding to the policy so when i save the policy and upload it the branding comes with it if i want to change the branding i have to change all the policies branding i know it sucks but this was the dev team's way to do it very quickly and very effectively so that is the way they chose to go with um so this is allowing you basically allow you to do those reboot prompts branded and nagging in a more nice and, and pretty way um so yeah that is um oh so yeah so that is that um basically that is basically it for that um okay so someone is saying can i change the branding for the patch management for windows devices or solar winds their own logo if I'm not mistaken, you can do that in the branding and in central. Um, and Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, but if as long as I go into the branding here, and as long as you change the images, uh, the images here, the reboot prompt, uh, this is the reboot dialogue that you're gonna see. This is what's gonna basically um, change for you. So, um, and so that would be that. Um, so hopefully, Eli, that clarifies that for you. You should be able to just change that and then it would use that. I've seen a lot of people do it very successfully. It uses the Windows Notification Center, which personally I turn off because I find annoying, uh, but most customers leave it on, so that would be an easy way. Um, so you can change that logo here easily. Uh, Virginia, to your question, what I showed earlier, this, this will do a pop-up to nag them. Let me see if I can run it. I've had an issue before because I had to rebuild my machine and something. Yeah, it works. Okay, and does this. Hey, buddy, blah, blah, blah. I can say reboot in an hour and just say do it. And then it would reboot in an hour. 
um, if I say remind me an hour, it would remind me an hour with the same prompt again. You can see here is my face, but it would be your logo, obviously. Um, and then they would say now, postpone. If you choose to give them decline, you can say cancel. Depending on what they choose, they do that. Now, if you run this policy over and over again as a self healing and do it like 10 times an hour, they would literally have 10 tasks. So please be very careful. I've had partners do this and just get really mad at me. Please, please be very, very careful. But this is allowing them to delay the reboot by up to whatever you chose so that they can do the reboot. So that's where sometimes I'll tell people, if you're a Windows machine, like mostly desktops and laptops, if they've been running for more than realistically like four or five days, even four days is too much. If you don't reboot every three to four to five days, please make sure you bug your customers to do it. So you can do an automation policy that goes like, hey, Mr. Customer, can you reboot your machine, please? Blah, 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 blah. Um, so yeah. So that is definitely um, something that you can do and you can leverage that to do it. So completely regardless of the patching and everything else, this would be something I would recommend to do so that if a machine is not reboot for a variety of reasons, that would be that. Now, some of the reasons that I see people not rebooting, obviously, is that they use the fast boot in Windows, which means that they don't fully reboot. Um, so uh, that would be something that you could, that, that would be a problem. You can also have a problem where, um, uh, the device does not get rebooted. Like if you're anything like me, I put my machine to sleep every night and once in a while I, I'm starting to have too many things and I'll reboot every two to three days technically because um, I have five monitors. You have like 80 things open at one, so I don't like to reboot too often. But if you don't reboot for too long, I start seeing little gremlins and weird stuff. So these prompts become very useful, right? Because you can say, I think, is there an object? Yeah, computer uptime which will give you a number of time in you know days hours and so on you can see if the uptime is more than 14 hours or 14 days or 10 days or five days then do that prompt and you can make that very easily um based on that behavior there's examples of that in the cookbook um so you're welcome to go grab them there um and uh alfie another question asking can we update a custom device property from a task sadly no uh there is through the apis you'll be able to do it so in theory you could um, but I have been asking for a new, uh, a new silent way to do the API connection for me for automation so that I can do interaction with the current API. So that would be things like custom properties, things like um, triggering, you know, creating customers, the configuration, things like that. Um, so I am looking forward to those, but at the moment, I don't have that. Um, so yeah, and if you need five monitors like I do, an easy way to convince your boss is to show it to them uh, I took a few good monitors from home and showed my boss how more efficient it was and how more stuff I could fit in. And then they said, like, okay, fine, here's monitors. So that was my way to convince people. I've been using four or five monitors for the better part of eight years now, and I would never go back to one or two. Um, so that is that is personally my thing. I'd rather have five 1080p monitor than, you know, one 4K, to be honest. So, yeah. It's a little slight track, but I like it. I like the question. And I'm kind of running out of question. I only have one more. Um, so um, if you have Windows Update Agent or Windows Update issues, do you have scripts to fix that? And to be honest, I don't have a proper script myself, but we have partners who have helped create stuff for this. And oh yeah, I forgot, I got kicked out of this. Um, hold on, I have to get back to it, there you go. So when I'm here, um, let's take a look. I'm, Pretty sure there's something for this. Windows update. Uh, where did it go? How do we did? I'm trying to find it. I can't find a script I'm thinking of. There is a script that was made to fix Windows update agent. Um, shoot. You may want to search for patch. That's how I. Okay, find let's let's for patch. Uh, yeah, the patch reboot using the registry, pre-patch prompt, I was talking about that. Oh, the PME fix. Yeah, so that one is a um, the pulling the PME version. That one is the PME repair. If you have issues with patching, um, that is a good thing to look at. This was built by Ashley Alp. This was not built by us, but this is an amazing tool that goes to through and does all these things uh, on, to fix uh, PME and patching within N Central if you have any issues. So uh, if it is something that you're having issues with, definitely something I would recommend you take a look at. Um, all right. So choo -choo -choo. 
All right, next question. Uh, what is a self-leading feature doing in the patch management and can you confirm how to properly set the device to create system restore points prior to pushing driver updates? Uh, do you want to answer that one, Jason? Might be better off for you, to be honest. Are you still there? Did we lose Jason? I'm still here, I was just trying to find the mute button. Uh, um, not something I've ever you know, done myself, but I know you can use Automation Manager to, to do the system restore uh or to push the the system restore updates um i don't know if i would do a self-healing on patch management for that per se um well you and i have been I, dabbling with the with with chris and the pm team uh actually the new chris um mm -hmm. on doing uh patch self-healing and splitting the patch management the patch monitoring in multiple instances right if, and, yes if we did something like that i would say let's go for it but currently yeah. Patch is just really noisy, so it can trigger on many different types of things, whether it's PME, Windows Update Agent, uh, a failed patch, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just to trigger a self-heal on the patch status v2 is not something I would recommend. You would want to create separate monitoring and then tie it to that um, first and or <laughs> wait until we come out with something like patch status v3, for example. Yeah, I maybe if you guys have suggestions on this, Jason and I were talking with the PM team on this two or three weeks ago around patch monitoring, and we had differing opinions on this. Personally, I like the fact that there's a ton of stuff, but it's very noisy when you try to get alerts out of it. My suggestion personally was to have multiple instances of it. So you can do patch status v2, and then you can have an instance name like we do for a lot of other services. Then I could say, okay, this one monitors the PME summary or the PME health. This one monitors missing patches by A. This one monitors and so on. So I have three or four patch status per device. Then you could have different alerting, different self-healing, because you could then do a self-heal only if PME goes nuts, then do the self-heal with a repair script. Right. Is that something that you guys would be looking for? Or would you prefer to have multiple different services that are limited to what they are? I find my suggestion is more flexible, but it's more complex for, for people that are not familiar with it. Whereas Jason's suggestion was to have, you know, a service for this one, a service for this one, and so on and so on. And having more services would be easier to use, but we were more limited, in my opinion. Uh, if she guys have suggestions for that, uh, let me know. Um, so far, all I have is Alfie saying that mine is better. Obviously, uh, mine is better, Jason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to that. Uh, but the, but the, other part of that, the other part of that is we're lumping everything into that patch status v2, right? So if we can segment, say, patch by age versus the criticality of driver updates, so if they go into a failed state, then we do a restore or a self-heal, that, that would be amazing. Um, because right now, that workflow is just not possible. Yeah. In, in I think if we do both our ideas, we're better for it. So basically split it and then give us instances. I think then we can do absolutely anything. It's hard, exactly. but it's it's super flexible. So yeah, I think in that case, both sound good. <laughs> so, okay, good. So glad to get a feedback. That's what I was in the point. But yeah, to your question, I would not recommend using that self-feeling really ever. Um, it is there because it was allowed when it was built. It was basically a checkbox in the code for some services. So it's not a big deal, but it was not turned on. And I would not recommend turning it on either. Um, so that's, that's a good point. Uh, someone's asking, how do I obtain the device ID for an, from an automation policy? I could call the API from a script to update a custom property. The appliance ID is found in the agent XML file and it's in the local machine. So you can grab that from there, Alfie. Um, but then if you want to grab the device ID, you have to do an API call to say, get device info for one device with the appliance ID. It will return you the device ID and then you do the API call to um uh to then uh connect um so uh yeah and patch on demand on the api is on my list by the way it is absolutely on the list um so yeah you can do all of what you're asking for alfie but it's a little tricky i do have a patch boot camp that we gave at empower uh sorry an api boot camp that i gave at empower we're going to be redoing it this quarter so please make sure you register for that um if you are interested uh yeah because you'd have to do device get and then you would have to do the um the uh, custom property set so that would be two calls but it's easy enough uh, there are samples of this that are available in the api bootcamp if you don't want to wait for it just send me an email i'll send you a lab manual that's all the samples that i use uh, okay 
And so while I wait for final questions, don't forget if you're not joined in the partner advisory group, I think we're doing one in late Q3, early Q4, uh, a PAG meeting. So we're gonna go through a of updates, roadmaps, things like that. So make sure you put PAG in the, in the questions pane and we'll make sure to add you to the list. Um, we love to have as many people as we, we can in those. Get your feedback, let us know what you guys think um and go from there so if you're not in the pack already i'll make sure to take your email down thank you alfie i saw that uh, and with that guys i uh, think that'll be it have a wonderful rest of your day look at that fancy animation there um have a wonderful rest of your day we'll see you in the next one and uh, yeah if you have anything else reach out to jason and i anytime thanks everyone